Hey, it's Rich, the Louisiana Hobby Guy. Today we're going to be doing a pure light burn tutorial on your kerf setting. So if you've ever wondered why when you cut out a puzzle and you go to put the puzzle together, the parts are too loose or the parts are too tight. That's probably not going to happen, but the parts will probably be too loose. Or maybe you've uh, downloaded a file from a box generator. Maybe you followed my tutorial on making the little sticky notes box and your parts are fitting way too loose. Well, we're going to jump right into the tutorial today in Lightburn and I'm going to show you how to fix that so that you can adjust it manually. And without having to buy anything, uh, buy a file, cut and print all these uh, other files to figure out what your curves offset is, none of that. This is going to be a quick an easy tutorial to show you how to find what your kerf is and how to adjust it to, for the absolute perfect fit of an inlay or a puzzle or a cutout. So let's get started in Lightburn. All right, so here we go. Um, now you're going to hear noise today, background noise. Nothing I can do about that. <laughs> it's, it's in the 90s here with humidity way up there. So the air conditioner is going to be on for the rest of the summer. <laughs> I promise you that uh, that air conditioner is going to stay on today. Uh, anyway, here is my kerf test, and this is uh, my kerf test for my 80 watt Monport CO2. Now, uh, I'm going to make this test available for download, so that anyone can download this, anyone can use it. Uh, I'm going to put an actual direct link in the description in the show more section below the video i'm going to put a direct link there where you'll download the file directly to your computer now it is possible because i'm doing this on a co2 and you may be doing it on a diode laser or your origin may be different than mine so my origin is top right if your origin is top left well then this uh entire graphic here is going to be mirrored uh, I don't know what horizontally <laughs> mirrored horizontally right so if your origin is bottom right it's going to be mirrored vertically so you'll have to flip the graphic uh, if it's bottom left like a lot of diode lasers you'll have to do both you'll have to flip it both ways and the way that you do that is very simple you just press the control key and the letter a which selects everything that's on your work bed here and you come up here to the top and you'll see right here is the horizontal oh the vertical I'm sorry <laughs> the vertical flip so uh, you may actually get this if you are a diode user this is what it's gonna look like when you get it okay so all you have to do is select it all and flip flip in whatever direction you need to get it in the right spot all right so that you can read all of this text now all of this text is on a tool path over here so uh, you'll see that everything that's flashing right now will not burn because uh, there is no output if you look right over here no output so nothing is going to be output to your laser I do have it set to show I do not have it set to frame because you don't want to frame all of this you just want to frame and cut out this one piece right here which is just some arbitrary graphic that I made with some lines on it it doesn't matter really what it is uh, you could just use this one as is this one is I think it's about five inches long let me see it's a little over five inches long and about an inch and a half tall and for you folks across the pond that's going to be 130 millimeters by uh, almost 40 so um, there you go now I, I like to do this in inches you can do it in either way inches millimeters makes no difference whatsoever uh, now I want to talk about kerf offset and all of the tools that you may have seen for sale <laughs> on Etsy and other places uh, you're gonna find that you're gonna find these files for seven eight nine dollars and it's gonna be a file that uh, when it's gonna be very similar to this except uh, it's just cutouts um, with gaps in between them where you take your material and you slip your material in and they have all different sizes 
I, I don't understand what the science is behind all of that. Um, I, I do understand what the marketing science is behind all of that. Make it super complicated and people are not going to try and replicate it themselves and do it themselves. They'll rather spend the seven, eight or nine dollars on your product and you're going to make a whole bunch of money out of it. So confuse the heck out of the people to the point where they say, oh, I can't do this myself. I'll just buy it and go from there. OK, fine. I get that. Um, I, I don't think it's ethical because this is just a very simple test. Nobody should be charging you for this. L let me just show you how to do it. Do it yourself and go from there. I mean, that this is a community of people, laserists, laser engravers, uh, woodworkers, you know, CNC people. We're, we're a big community of like-minded people. And well, some things, you know, I have my own store, engravingcutfiles.com, where I sell, you know, light burn libraries and laser ready graphics and light burn files and things like that. But that's something that's beyond the scope of learning how to use your laser. So that's why I have the store. Plus it helps me, you know, fund the channel. And of course, all of your wonderful donations from people like you out there watching uh, it also helps to fund the channel, keep this, this going. But, um, you know, that's not the point here. The point here is that how about we just learn how to do it, do it ourselves. You know what? You can have this file. It's, it's nothing. It, it took literally five minutes to set this up. So why should I be charging for you? If you think it's worth something, you can hit that little thank you button down there and send me a dollar or two, you know, but there's no reason why you should have to buy this. It's just so easy to do. So let's talk about what this is. All this is, is 20 cuts across here. You have one cut that starts here, and then you have another here, another here, all the way up to the 20th cut right over here. And now a lot of people will tell you that you can do this with four squares or uh, 10 squares or something like that. I don't think it's quite as accurate as doing it with 20 cuts. So 20 cuts is going to give you the most accurate uh, kerf number that you can find. So with that said, we're going to just run this file. Now, on my cut settings over here, I'm going to bring up my cut settings. I'm going to cut this out. And your settings are going to be different. Don't ask me what, what your settings should be. Uh, run a cut test. <laughs> run a cut grid. Find out what your cut settings is are for the material that you're going to be using. In this case, I'm using three millimeter wood. My settings will be different than yours. And in here I have, you can see a kerf offset of 0 0.09125. Well, if you look down here, that's what my last test produced, 0 0.09125. Now, for this video, I have to get rid of this and set that to zero, okay? So now we have no kerf offset set on our cut layer right here all right and that's the only way that this is going to work so you can't have anything in your kerf offset right here i'm going to say okay and now what i'm going to do is i'm going to run this file cut all of this out and now now when i cut this out there'll be little gaps in between every cut so then i'm going to slide all of these pieces to the left that's easier said than done <laughs> Be very careful when you do this. Don't mix up the pieces. Just try and slide them all very gently. I have the worst time doing this. Uh, I'm sure that you're gonna, I'm not gonna get lucky. I already know that because I've done this quite a few times. Never, it's never an easy job, but we're gonna slide all of these cut pieces to the left. And once we slide all the cut pieces to the left, there'll be a gap on the right hand side over here where it says R. There'll be a big gap over here. And that will be the cut offset of 20 cuts. And then the math formula is very easy. You get out your caliper, your digital caliper. You measure the distance over here that you have open space. Where now you've slid all of these 20, 19 pieces over to the left. Now there's a space over here. We're going to measure that space. So the last time that I did this, here's my example, which is the last time I did it. After I slid all the pieces to the left, 
I had a 3.65 opening. I don't know why that says 3.64, it's 3.65 here. Let me change that real quick because that is wrong. Okay. All right, so we had a three, I had a 3.65 opening. I did get it right over here. So what I do, what I do now is I divide that number by 20, which is the number of cuts that were made here. So 3.65 divided by 20. <laughs> Another mistake there. Don't you just love when I do these these live things? <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, I, I type I typed this up really quickly before we started having this as the original guide. So now I have 3.65 divided by 20. That equals 0.1825. Now I divide that number by two because there's a curve on both sides of the piece, okay? And this is the number that I come up with, 0 0.09125, all right? So we're gonna cover that. The math is really very, very simple. So the first thing we're gonna do is I'm gonna actually run this job right now. So on, on my laser, I'm gonna be using the uh, Monport 80 watt, which is ready. I'm gonna come to my cuts and layers. Just gonna make ensure that there's nothing set in my cur curf offset. And this is the, la the layer that I'm always gonna use to cut, is the red. So once I've done this, I can put my curf offset in there. It's gonna remember it for the next time I cut, all right? So now I'm just gonna run this job and uh, I'm gonna show you the results. What was that? A bee just flew by. <laughs> so let me hit start uh, bring up the other camera let's run this job I'll show you what I do to get that number and then we'll come right back All right, so there we go. <laughs> I told you that wasn't going to be easy. Um, it, it is a little bit of a pain in the butt, especially with my fingers, to uh, get these things to work their way down, you know, tight up against the other side. But I came up with that number of 3.64, which is about what I got here, 3.65. Um, I was expecting it to be the same. Stick around for part two coming up in a, in a minute, where we're going to talk about the reason why this number could vary so make sure you don't miss that part that's going to come up in just a minute but let me show you how now all of this works together so i am going to open uh, a calculator standard calculator in windows and we came up with 3.64 this time so we have 3.64 divided by 20 which is the number of cuts that we just did equals 0.182. We're going to divide that number by 2 because there's a cut on either side. 
and we come up with 0 0.091. So that's that's how quickly it is. So I was pretty close. That's what I had last time, 0 0.09125. Now all I'm going to do is come back to the cuts and layers, bring up my red layer, which is the layer that I personally use to cut with. I'm going to take that number in the curve offset. I'm going to put 0 0.091. One outward okay it's a positive number so now the further outward you go the tighter the fit will be when you try and put two pieces together the further inward you go the more loose the fit will be my perfect fit here is going to be 0 0.091 now this even though it's a perfect fit it may not be exactly perfect for let's say a puzzle that you want your children to use and you know reuse over and over again because that 0 0.091 is going to be the perfect fit so uh, it may be hard to push the pieces together you may have to use a little rubber mallet but they will fit perfectly where you don't even need any glue okay so now if you wanted to loosen that up some let's say you were making a puzzle for the children to use then maybe you'd want to go 0 0.08 instead of 0 0.091. So that would be something that you'd want. And that's the reason why they sell these tools online. So that you can stick them into the different slots and find out exactly what kind of fit you want to get. But I really think that that's all unnecessary. I've never had a problem using this kerf offset and then just thinking to myself, do I want it super tight? Where I have to use a little mallet to knock it in, that would be 0 0.091. Or do I want it to be a puzzle? On a puzzle, I would do uh, 0 0.07 personally, myself, and that would make it fit in and out nice and easily. So this is something that you know you'll get used to after you've done your first cut. Run two puzzle pieces with the 0 0.091, and you'll see what I'm talking about. It'll be a tight fit. Now, you're not going to want to use this type of a kerf offset on something like my Eiffel Tower project that I posted a while back because that has many different cuts in different places that have to all be pieced together at the same time. And that might be, this might be a little too tight for that. Um, on my Eiffel Tower, I did it at 0 0.03, if I'm not mistaken, just to tighten it up. And the first couple of Eiffel Towers that I did I did it with no curve offset whatsoever and just used the glue. And then later on, I figured out, you know what? I needed to fit a little bit tighter. So I did it at either 0 0.02 or 0 0.03. I don't remember which one it was, but that's where they just, I put a little glue on there and they just kind of squeezed together and I did them one at a time. So um, that, that was the perfect curve offset for that project. You'll get used to this as you go. So there, now we have that 0 0.091. As soon as I say, okay, Lightburn is going to save it on this cut layer permanently. So, and I always use red to cut. So if you always use black to cut, you'd want to do this on your black layer or whatever color layer that you're using that you typically use to cut. And so that's about it. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is the reason why this number would change. And there is a reason why this number would change over time, over the course of a week or two weeks or even a couple of days, depending on how you use your laser. So if you're a heavy user of the laser and you don't clean your lens and your mirrors on a CO2 daily, this number might change slightly. So um, cleaning and maintenance is really important. If, if you're in a commercial setting you start at 8 o'clock in the morning, you finish at 4 o'clock in the evening, uh, either in the morning or the evening, you're going to want to clean your mirrors, you're going to want to clean your lens to prepare for the next day. Uh, a diode laser, same thing. Now, when it comes to cleaning, uh, there, there are even manufacturers out there that will tell you the wrong way to clean your lens and your mirrors. Prom I promise you, <laughs> even the manufacturers are going to tell you the wrong way to do it because they're more interested in sales than anything else but i had a good friend uh, he's passed away now 
um, but he was in the business and he was the person that put the coatings on the mirrors for you know big hundred thousand dollar co2 cutters uh, 25 to two hundred thousand dollar machines and in fact he worked for the company for for quite a while he did uh, for a long time he did the coatings application and then for a while after that he did the polishing and finishing and packaging you know so very experienced at it and he told me now years ago 15 years ago I bought this commercial laser from a parish auction didn't know what it was had to learn all about it that's how I actually became friends with this gentleman and he told me that these coatings that they put on these lenses and these mirrors are thousandths of an inch thick very very thin very thin super thin coatings and they're easily damaged so the the one thing that you don't want to do is damage your lens or your mirrors because it will affect the curve offset you need to have clean lens clean mirrors to do this and you cannot and here's where you know i'm probably going to get a bunch of opposite comments down below but it doesn't matter what you say to me because this one following this one little procedure is you know bible verse to me <laughs> i will not use any abrasive cleaners on my mirrors or my lenses period doesn't matter what you say in the comments what your opinion is or anything else i got this straight from an expert you do not use anything that has that's ammonia based or um, <clears throat> any type of abrasive so you can't use Windex, you can't use even lens cleaners. I've seen uh, in the photo store, I, I used to buy Calzis cleaner until I found out that it had ammonia in it, which is an abrasive cleaner. I've since, and this company does not sponsor me at all, I've since switched to a brand called Purity that I get on Amazon and I'll put a link down below in the description and this little bottle has a micro sprayer on the top so this bottle is about six months old and you can see that I've used very little here and I probably use this every day or every other day you know at the longest it, it sprays out a micro burst I use a microfiber towel and this little package came with it I have them in white and this one came with silver microfiber uh, light color is the best way to go you you unscrew your air assist unscrew your nozzle unscrew your retainer drop your lens into the center of the microfiber cloth give it a shot spritz flip it over give that a spritz fold the cloth over and just very gently very gently rub it take a look at it always hold it in this position Never hold it sideways so in case the mirror drops out or the lens, uh, the lens of the mirror drops out. And I always do this with a towel underneath just in case uh, it falls out. But then you want to look at it and see if it's clean. If it's not clean, move it to another spot. Just slightly move it over. Spritz it again. Do it again. And you'll be able to see. You probably can't see on the mirror. There's a black spot there. There's one over here. There's a, a few dark spots on here. This cloth is almost ready to get washed. But um, that, the reason I like using the light colored cloths is so that you can see if after you've gently rubbed it, you've sprayed it and rubbed it, if anything comes off. When you get it to the point where it's a beautiful, nice shine, uh, then you know you can drop it back in. And yes, on the CO2, convex side is up, flat side is down. Doesn't matter what anybody tells you. Uh, the physics in that is pretty clear. You know, if you look at the way the laser beam comes down like this, you'll know that the flat side is supposed to go down. But anyway, that's beside the point. With the diode lasers, you can do the same thing. Take the diode out of the holder, hold it in your left hand. Usually, you can just take your finger and the cloth, put it in the hole, and turn the laser module with a very gentle pressure on the lens, and then look at it and see if it's clean. If it's not clean, use another spot, do it again. On a lot of diode lasers, you'll see a little slot in the lens on both sides. You can take an oversized screwdriver, unscrew the lens, take it out, and clean it that way. But just remember, very gentle. Now, if you get dirt buildup on your lens, you're going to run into trouble. Uh, I just had, a couple weeks ago, one of my 
biggest supporters, Jan Mueller in Texas, sent me an email, said, hey, can you log into my computer and help me with some issues I'm having? I'm burning double lines. And I said, sure, no problem, but let me ask you a question first. When was the last time that you cleaned your, your lens? Uh, and she said, um, never. <laughs> so when I heard double lines, I kind of figured that that lens was cracked. So uh, I say, okay, well, can you, uh, you know, unscrew your air assist, unscrew your nozzle, unscrew the retainer, and uh, take the lens out and see if it's dirty. So her husband happened to be there. He did it, he unscrewed it, and as soon as he took it out, he saw it was cracked in half. And the reason that happens, and this was a, a Boss laser, 60 watt, I believe. The reason that that happens, the laser passes directly through the, the lens on your, uh, on your laser. So that laser has no resistance, passes directly through, causes no heat whatsoever. However, as you're cutting throughout the day, smoke, soot, you know, debris comes up, back up into the nozzle if your air assist isn't strong enough. So like on the CO2, you have the blow and the wind. If your blow is not strong enough, you, the smoke will come up into it. Um, sometimes on some lenses, the, the air assist goes directly into the side, which causes uh, you know, the air to go around in a circle, and sometimes that even pulls up the smoke uh, into the lens. So at the end of every day, you have to clean it because if it gets dirty with soot, smoke, what happens is, yeah, the laser is still gonna pass right through the middle because it'll burn right through the, the dirt and the debris, but the, the debris that's around the outside of the laser is gonna heat up. And as that heats up during your cuts, what's gonna happen is it's gonna heat up to the point where it's gonna crack the glass. So uh, I know a lot of people, it seems interesting to me that manufacturers don't tell you this, but um, who knows, maybe, maybe they wanna sell you more lenses. Another reason why it would change is if you use a different lens. So on my machine here, I've got a two, uh, one and a half, two inch, two and a half and four inch lens that I use. And uh, I also use combination lenses, uh, convex and meniscus together for engraving. But um, when you change your lens, you're gonna have to do this test one more time. So that's the second thing uh, that you have to do is when you change lenses. Um, now for the mirrors, same thing. Take your little sprayer, spray it into the mirror, very gently with your microfiber cloth, clean it out with your fingertip. That's all you need to do on your mirrors, number one and two. Mirror number three, you just uh, unscrew the top of the mirror, take the mirror out, clean it, put it back in, make sure it's dry before you put it back in, screw it back in place and you're done. So those are some important things. And I think I'm gonna do a video on cleaning where I actually clean the CO2 lens as well as the diode lens, you know, to make this a little more clear but uh, I think it's a really easy process that you, you know, just by listening to me right now, you probably got the hang of it. Uh, very simple to do, but remember, non-abrasive cleaner, and it doesn't matter, like I used to go to Walgreens and I can't remember the name of the brand that I got, but uh, it was non-abrasive uh, after I had this talk with my friend and they stopped carrying it. And rather than searching the shelves over there, Walmart, you know, has it, CVS has it, um, uh, Walgreens has it, you know, uh, any photo store is going to have it, but you have to check the ingredients and make sure that what you're getting does not have abrasives in there because that will change, number one, the focus of the laser and it'll actually make the focus, it'll take it out of focus slightly, which will make it harder to cut and it'll give you, uh, uh, you know, a bad engraving. So all these little micro scratches that you get from these abrasive cleaners really do affect the lenses. And if you've been, uh, you know, doing this cleaning with abrasive cleaners, then, you know, spend the 30 bucks and go, go pick up a, a, a new lens, a new convex lens or whatever, um, and start from scratch using a pure cleaner. And like I said, I'll put a link to this, this purity uh, cleaner down below. A bottle like this, uh, should last the average user, I don't know, a year, maybe more, even a commercial user. Uh, this comes with, uh, I think, two of these little spray bottles and a, uh, I think, a nine-ounce refill, 
something like that. So this this will last a very very long time. It's only a couple of dollars, and it's worth every single. And it does come with the little microfiber cloth that you can wash. So really important keeping your lens and your mirrors uh, your mirrors adjusted and clean and your lens clean. And uh, if you do those two things, you're going to avoid a lot of problems with your CO2 laser and with your diode laser, especially a lot of people say, well, it's been losing power. Um, I don't really subscribe to that theory that they lose power quickly. Like a lot of people do. I have some, my original diode lasers that I used for production uh, that ran thousands of hours are still next door. My old, you know, original diode lasers before they were even a thing and uh, they still work just like they did when they were new and I think the main reason for that is because uh, I keep those lenses clean and it all has to do with the lens and uh, with the diode lenses I actually um, replaced one or two lenses I don't remember how many on three different machines but I changed them to to M8 lenses because uh, I wanted to cut better with the diode so that was the only reason that I changed them I could have kept those all these years and all the production work that they've done I could have kept the original lens the original diode mod laser module and it would still be performing like new so uh, I know that they do degrade over time and from, from what I've learned from the technicians uh, that number is not as big as we believe it to be um, it'll the first 10 percent goes the fastest and then after that it's a very very slow decline from there so um, yeah that's about it so I hope you enjoyed this video today uh, this is something that I wanted to make it's been on my list for about three months now and I wanted to push this one out because just recently I've gotten a lot of questions about the curve offset and one person in particular <clears throat> was ready to buy these files off of Etsy and I think it was eight dollars or 850 something like that and I said, why in the world would you need to buy those files? You know, uh, all you have to do is find out what the curve offset is on your laser. Now, remember, this file is for one particular laser. So if you have two or three lasers, you have to run this file on all two or three of those lasers because every one of them is going to have a different curve offset. So keep that in mind. So don't just get this file, do it set your cut layer and then trash it you need to keep the file eventually you're going to probably replace that laser if you're like any of the other laserists that i know so uh, or you're going to add another laser to your shop you know or you might add a co2 laser this file will be you know handy to use in the future and like i said i'll put a link down below uh if if you like it rather than buy it somewhere <laughs> if you like it you could just go ahead and click the little thanks button down there and donate a dollar or two to the effort. But there's, you, there's no need to. Uh, you know, this is a pure training video. I want you to get the most out of your uh, laser experience that you can get. And I want you to have the least amount of questions. So that's the reason I'm doing this video today. So I hope you enjoyed the video as much as I enjoyed making it for you. And as always, I thank you for watching. And I'll see you in the next one.